Welcome back, everybody, to American Civil War history of. I am going to start by looking at some basic fundamental ways that the history of this war has been looked at over the period since it occurred over 150 years ago now. What might have been the cause of this war? What is it that divides the various states of the Union into these opposite poles at, in which they're ready to start essentially killing each other and going to war, ripping up the Union, the United States, as it had gone on since already, since 1776. So this is certainly a major interruption in the body politic of the United States. Um, is it slavery and the question of abolition of slavery that certainly is the first thing that we often learn in school as children, that one side had slaves and the other did not, and that slavery is therefore bad, um, and freedom is good, and therefore the side that had slaves, sorry, I'll start that again. The question that we often what is it about that particular historical period that led to this incredible division among Americans between American states that led them to go to war with each other, kill each other, and essentially threatened to destroy a union that had been proceeding since 1776, since the American Revolution, essentially potentially destroying what would have been the United States. The answer that we most often come to, of course, is the issue of slavery. That's the thing that we often are taught as um, children, we're taught that in in school. Um, the principle is that uh, one side had slaves and the other side, uh, the Union did not. And since slavery is bad and freedom is good, therefore the side that had the slaves, the Southern Confederacy, were the bad guys. And at least um, that's how it, certainly it's taught in Canada, um, even though during the Civil War itself, Canadians mostly sympathized with the South, with the Confederacy, and not with the Union in the North, with whom we were on the brink of going to war with during that period. Still, um, at any point in history, you would have a hard time convincing anybody south of the Mason-Dixon line that um, the South was, was um, necessarily bad. Um, and, and certainly in the South, the polarity of history is, is reversed. The Civil War there is known as um, the War of Northern Oppression. Uh, certainly when Obama was uh, elected uh, 12 years ago now, I was teaching this course, and this is a cartoon that appeared in the Toronto Star the day after his uh, election. Um, I uh, showed this in during my lectures then at uh, Ryerson, and it, it essentially encapsulizes everything that we think about um, the Civil War and how Lincoln and um, the Union performed in it and the position that um, that somehow this war was a noble war fought against slavery um, 
it's often, as I say, our, our first lesson in the subtleties of history. And, and, you know, we learn to our surprise that, um, you know, although the institution of slavery was the primary, primary currency of the political divisions that led to war between North and South, slavery um, was more an issue before the war. And for a long time, once the war started, it became less an issue. In the sense, for example, that in the first year, uh, certainly the first summer of the war, whenever slaves escaped across Confederate lines to the Union, the Union made a point of returning the slaves back to the Confederacy. And that's an issue of what actually the stake was in, 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 in the war. And obviously, if the slaves are being returned to the Confederacy by the Union, it's not the abolition of slavery. There are other primary constitutional issues at stake. And one of them is um, the constitutional requirement of free states to return escaped slaves from their free territories back to their slave owners in, in slave territories. So, you know, through this course, we're going to look at the evolution of that uh, process, but certainly it's not as simple as we, we, we think. There has been this major debate, especially over the last four years of the Trump presidency over um, Confederate monuments, their meaning and um, their continued presence, uh, you know, Confederate monuments in some states are, are being taken down. Um, I, I think it's important to look certainly at the time these Confederate monuments went up you could see that that uh, these monuments were not immediately raised in the post-war period, but they actually um, come at the height of what is the implementation of a kind of um, Jim Crow laws and segregation in the South, the um, reascendancy of Southern white power. And, and, and so it's, we see that these monuments actually are going up um, at their peak in 1906, 1909, uh, 1912, in that period, precisely when the Second Klan is beginning to accumulate these millions of members that they will accumulate. So they're not um, the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set, as, as some of these guys claim. Um, and certainly these Confederate monuments have become rallying points for not just um, neo-Confederates, but as well um, various racist organizations, including neo-Nazis, as we saw at uh, Charlottesville. Um, and, um, you know, of, of course, all the kind of radical right racist elements are now rallying behind the preservation of these um, early 20th century Confederate memorials, which were essentially raised to remind the African American community just exactly what their status is in these southern uh, communities. They like to say, the protesters there, that you cannot change history, but you can learn from it. Well, um, one of the first things a historian learns is that the history actually is constantly changing. Uh, the past is not fixed. Every time we learn something about the past, something new, we change it. Um, the past is constantly being updated with research, with new documents coming 
to light with um, a new analysis of information we already know. Um, and, you know, essentially, as as uh, you know, Oscar Wilde reputedly said, um, a history is what we think should have happened, and what we think should have happened changes with the social condition and circumstances in which we currently live when we look back at history. So uh, believe me, history is the one thing you can change. The past is infinite, infinitely changeable for a uh, historian. So history is, it's not something that, that was. There is a, a kind of technical term for it, um, historiography. Historiography is almost a perverse notion. Um, I guess one can simplify it as describing it as the history of history. Um, it's a, a record of how we have been changing our historical viewpoint of the past with various factors and knowledge and social mores. Um, we constantly, as I say, are viewing the past in, in new ways, inevitably reflecting our current situation. Um, in fact, one would argue that history actually is a study of the future, uh, because if you understand how our current situation is rooted in the past, we, of course, begin to understand how our future is rooted in the present. And, and, and so um, a historian, by looking at the past and uh, looking how the past has brought us into the present can make a fairly educated estimate of what the likely outcomes from the present are going to be in the future. Um, that's what a historian does. And, and in a way, um, you know, that's the reason why often banks and financial institutions like historians as analysts, because they have a good sense of the relationship of, um, you know, the present with the past. And of course, that also involves uh, how the present is going to evolve in, in the future. So historians essentially are futurists. So the historiography, um, it's interesting if we, if we go back and look at how people at the time looked at the Civil War. And, and um, in 1865, when Lincoln was being inaugurated uh, for the second time shortly before his ass assassination, in his inaugural address, Lincoln says this remarkable thing. He says, all know that slavery was somehow the cause of the war. Somehow the cause of the war. Even Lincoln cannot precisely articulate how slavery was exactly the cause of the war beyond this kind of vague statement that it was somehow the cause of the war. And indeed, it somehow was. And, and, and so that's kind of the historiographical, historiographic debate that emerges around the question of the Civil War. What was it um, and what was exactly its relationship to, um, to the abolition of slavery and just to the institution of slavery itself? This is New York Senator William Seward. Um, he will become Lincoln's Secretary of State, um, the most senior member of a presidential uh, cabinet. And in many ways, William Seward lays the early foundational historiography of what the Civil War was about um, on the eve of the war, before the war started in 1858. In 1858, um, William Seward says that the factional divisions that threatened the Union are composed of two sides. 
one side, there were those who believed the conflict um, was accidental, unnecessary, um, the work of interested or um, fanatical agitators. On the other side, he argued that there was a, quote, an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces, among which Seward counted himself. In other words, according to Seward, um, the intrinsic differences between North and South were so deeply ingrained and incompatible with each other that war was inevitable. This irrepressible conflict argument is going to dominate the historiography of the Civil War from the 1860s as the Civil War was unfolding pretty much into the 1920s. The primary argument of this school of history was that the war was inevitable because there was no room for compromise on the central issue of slavery, that no modern civilized democratic state could compromise on slavery, and that therefore the Union, the United States, was a modern civilized democratic state, the good guys, while the Southern Confederacy the rebels were the bad guys, the uncivilized slave holders. There are um, other arguments that begin to develop in the early 20th century and, and, and start taking deeper roots after the 1920s. Um, one of the primary arguments is that what we're looking at in the United States is a clash between two civilizations. Um, the agrarian agricultural civilization of the South, the Confederacy, whose base economy was cotton, tobacco, uh, rice, um, in other words, agrarian products, versus um, the emerging industrial civilization of, of the North. Um, that incompatible interests of an agrarian society of the South um, were in opposition to the voracious needs of the industrial society of the North. Um, this was uh, the argument, according to historians uh, Charles and Mary Beard, um, that uh, these, quote, inherent antagonisms or irrepressible conflict that Seward um, described that were actually um, irreparably dividing the Union on the basis of economic determinism. Um, Charles and Mary Beard, they called the Civil War the second American Revolution, argue, arguing that, quote, um, that armed conflict had been only one phase of the cataclysm, a transitory phase, that at the bottom of the so-called civil war or the war between the states was a social war ending in the unquestioned establishment of a new power in the government making vast changes in the arrangement of classes in the accumulation and distribution of wealth in the course of industrial development and in the constitution inherited from the fathers end of quote. Historians were not very comfortable with this view that somehow the American Revolution um, needed to be completed by civil war or that it was a second American um, revolution. Uh, many see the abolition of slavery in the United States only as the revolutionary result of the civil war not necessarily the, the uh, cause of it. Certainly at the time, um, the connection with the American Revolution was 
made during the Civil War. Uh, those in the South called their revolt a revolution against the tyranny of the North. Northerners, on the co uh, contrary, viewed their conflict as the struggle to keep the Union together, which the revolution had created, um, the Union that was a result of the revolution against England. However, both sides viewed that war as essentially a continuation of their fight for freedom that started, and liberty, that started in 1776. So the beards were um, precise as to what they meant by revolution, um, but certainly by the 1940s, um, the, the Beard's thesis is now modified by another historian, Lewis Hacker, um, and, and his modification becomes known as the Hacker-Beard thesis of the American Civil War. Um, the Hacker-Beard thesis goes like this, quote, the American Civil War turned out to be a revolution indeed, but its striking achievement was the triumph of industrial capitalism. The industrial capitalists, through their political spokesmen, the Republicans, had succeeded in capturing the state and using it as an instrument to strengthen their economic position. It was no accident, therefore, that while the war was waged on the field and through Negro emancipation, in Congress's halls, the victory was made secure by the passage of tariff, banking, public land, railroad, and contract labor legislation. In other words, this was a economic war between two civilizations. Um, and particularly, if you look at kind of social theory in the 1960s and 1970s as to why those particular eras were so disruptive and revolutionary and chaotic. Um, you have the works of Alvin uh, Toffler. Al Alvin Toffler um, is arguing in two books, um, The Third Wave and um, In Future Shock, that industrial civilization is undergoing a change into a new digital informational age civilization. And certainly he was correct in, in, in that. He argued that future shock is um, the kind of disorder that is occurring as our industrial civilization is um, cataclysmically being dragged into a third form of civilization, digital informational civilization, that um, there were similar um, disorders, revolutions, and wars when agrarian society, agrarian civilizations were becoming industrialized since, um, you know, we kind of put the date at the beginning of the industrial world at 1750. From then on, various Western civilizations began industrializing at, at, at different rates. And indeed, there was a lot of um, chaos at that moment as a result, as people's wealth was defined, as um, the value of property was defined, uh, uh, capital became much more important than liquid capital, much more important than uh, real estate and land holdings. There were peasant rebellions, there were middle class rebellions. So um, Toffler argues that future, sh that, you know, that was an element of future shock and that in the 60s and 70s, we were experiencing all those riots and demonstrations, rising crime, um, all these third world wars um, were all um, aspects of this kind of transition of the industrial civilization now um, into a digital civilization. And the transition was much more uh, quick than it had been between the agrarian world, which took, um, uh, you know, 
centuries to essentially um, transform civilization in the case of digital civilization it has taken essentially uh, decades and 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 so anybody any baby boomer essentially has witness two civilizations, um, the industrial civilization into which they were born and the digital civilization in which they are now uh, living. There has never, you know, the, in the past, um, agrarian civilization did not quite transform into its industrial state at the rate at which we are all um, have been digitized now in 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 our life, in our um, income, in our economy, in our culture, in in essentially everything. We are indeed now a third civilization. So that's um, a, a kind of summary of the hacker beard thesis that it's about the needs of industrial capital to discipline um, this vast southern territory of the United States and uh, drag them into what's going to become uh, you know the industrial era and into what's going to become the 20th century and of course for the south it's uh, kicking back at that and um, will, you know, your first assignment kind of looks at the nature of um, societies in the United States between these um, two coexisting, certainly in, in the 19th century, American civilizations, the agrarian one in the South and um, the industrial one in the North. Although the North is still not completely industrialized in the way it would become in the 20th century. We are looking at incipient in industrialization in the North, but it's well on, 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 on that way. In the 1970s, um, Eric Foner, um, he's going to argue that in some ways the Civil War um, was driven by the free labor ideal that um, the moral concerns of abolitionists were actually uh, drafted on the economic determinism of the industrialists. Um, and in fact, that they were, um, you know, abolitionism was less important than a very popular free I labor ideal that northerners, not just um, factory owners and um, proprietors of industrial enterprises, but the workers themselves regarded slavery as a possible threat. The potential threat that northern factory workers and industrialists saw in slavery is what happens if the Confederacy begins industrializing and instead of employing free labor, begin to uh, put slaves into their factories. This is something of equal threat to both um, factory owners and to laborers who are eking out a desperate income as factory workers, as so-called free laborers, um, what is going to happen to their jobs if they can be replaced by uh, a slave? So um, this kind of is similar to the Hacker Beard thesis, but it, it kind of argues where the Hacker Beard thesis kind of looks at a um, capitalist uh, elite that is looking out for its interest. Um, Eric Fawner is suggesting that there is a uh, kind of impetus from below as well, from the working classes, from uh, free laborers to engage the South in the war and suppress slavery. That it's not about um, the reprehensible immorality of slavery, but that it's um, about, as I say, free labor and, and factory work. <clears throat> 
And you can see here, for example, a propaganda image from the time uh, defending slavery. You can see that uh, Southerners are portraying slavery where um, slaves are happily living on a plantation master's property. Um, the slaves are well taken care of. Um, elderly slaves um, have these pensions of food and, and a place to live and so forth. Um, if a slave gets sick, um, the owner will take care of that slave. And there's a certain logic in the argument, certainly, because every slave is a very valuable, what we would in accounting call um, capital property. Um, slaves, of course, at that time are not captured in war the way they might have been in Roman or in Greek civilization. Um, slaves are uh, bought and every slave um, is a valuable investment, um, you know, un until, of course, uh, there are children of slaves where uh, a slave owner can breed his slaves and, of course, have, have a whole separate income uh, from, from breeding slaves that essentially come free to them. Um, however, there is, as I say, some truth in that element that, um, you know, a slave who is uh, injured is of no use to his owner. And, and certainly um, some owners would have argued that their slaves will get even better medical care than um, their own family, uh, that their slaves are valuable to them as, as uh, machinery might be. On the flip side, of course, you have a 19th century free labor capitalism. Uh, labor, of course, in the 19th century is um, prohibited from organizing. Uh, unions are illegal. In fact, they will be right into the 20th century. Uh, to form a labor union is uh, going to be at the end of the 20th century in the United States, a felony, a violation of the Sherman Act, uh, which, which um, you know, it's considered uh, the Sherman Act uh, can be interpreted to see an organization of a trade union as a, a quote, conspiracy to restrain trade. And, and, and so in the 19th century, laborers had no rights. They essentially worked uh, 10 hours a day, six days a week. It was a six day, 10 hour, 12 hour work day. Um, if a laborer was not needed by the factory one day, that labor can be disposed of. It was disposable labor. There's no obligation to pay, um, uh, you know, vacation pay or uh, workman's compensation or insurance. If a female factory worker uh, becomes pregnant, uh, you know, there's no such thing as maternity leave. And, and indeed, um, often factory owners as well own the housing in which workers would be allowed to live while they worked in the factory and and so entire families um, if they're not needed as laborers would be arbitrarily evicted from their uh, housing fired um, as i say no rights if they're injured pregnant or um, for any reason and 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 so um they certainly had uh, the kind of freedom a slave doesn't have but there is a certain logic that a slave that is not well taken care of um, is, is not going to be particularly productive when they're needed to work on, on the field. Um, a slave that has uh, no work available to him has to be fed and cared for by his or her owner regardless of whether they have work at that moment or not, and um, in order that they are in shape to do the work when it arrives. So I, I, I don't want to necessarily argue that the two things are, um, you know, comparatively equal, but there 
as in all cases of propaganda, there are kernels of, of, of truth, certainly about the conditions of industrial laborers versus the condition in uh, slavery. Um, it, it depends also primarily on the slave owners. There were um, enlightened slave owners, um, there were indifferent slave owners, and there were brutal, sadistic, psycho slave owners as, as, as well, the full uh, gamut. So again, um, we're looking here at this question of, uh, once more, economic determinism and um, labor contracting systems and what does labor mean and, and what, of course, will happen if the South begins industrializing and, and slaves are now um, working in uh, factories, what is going to happen to the northern free labor system, as particularly in, uh, you know, the north, of course, with um, free labor constitutions would not be able to convert back to slavery. I mean, that was, that was kind of out of the question. Here again, you can see the kind of northern attitude towards uh, working labor. You look closer, it, 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 it kind of makes fun of the idea that uh, workers will have leisure. And um, I'll, I'll read the caption below here on the right. Um, when two hours is a day's work with um, three holidays every week, he will have to take plenty of exercise to keep in good physical condition. Ridiculous, this notion of workers going into a gym. Uh, nonsense. Um, he will travel in order to compare his own conditions with that of European working man. Again, um, something that most Americans would consider a ridiculous notion, that someone from the working class would actually travel anywhere. Um, doubtless, on the right, he will employ some of his leisure in writing essays on the condition of things in general. He will elect himself to Congress and look after his condition uh, there personally. And of course, by that time, everything will be in such a condition that fashionable society will welcome him with open arms. Absurd. The American working man of the future when labor agitators have improved his condition until he is perfectly uh, satisfied with it. That essentially is the American view of working classes and laborers throughout the 19th century and into um, the 20th century. It's actually after Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected um, in the 1930s that for the first time, American Union, um, the rights to collective bargaining is, is, is recognized. Prior to that, um, unions essentially were seen as a kind of a revolutionary um, activity. Too radical. There is um, another approach that um, kind of emerges from Alan Nevin's study. He writes this eight-volume ordeal of the Union between 1847 and, uh, 1947 and 1971, and, and the first four volumes of his um, history essentially look at the causes of the war and he argues that slavery actually was only one factor in an overall ethnocultural divide between the North and South. That the North and South were separate peoples with such fundamental differences in, quote, assumptions, tastes, and cultural aims, end of quote, that made it impossible to live together. 
that these are different societies, the South and the North, different cultures, different even civilizations. And that argument is a strong one to this day. It's sometimes described as um, the neo-Confederate view because of its popularity in the South today, that we Southerners actually are a completely different people from Northerners. And this school of historians argue that the North and South went to war because they represented two distinct and irreconcilable cultures down to their bloodlines. Um, it's argued by neo-Confederates, while Southerners descended from, you know, it's argued by Southerners that um, white Southerners descended from uh, freedom-loving Celts of Scotland, Ireland, and, and Wales, um, and, and therefore uh, rebels, while Northerners, New England abolitionists in particular, came from the mercantile and ex expansionist English uh, stocks. Um, the, the leading proponent of that historiography today is Grady McQuinney, uh, the author of uh, Cracker Culture, Culture uh, cracker culture, Celtic ways in the Old South, and Confederate crackers and cavaliers. Um, another of his books is uh, Attack and Die, Civil War Military Tactics and the Southern Heritage, um, in which he argues that the South fought the Civil War like their brave and heedless ancestors, hurling themselves in suicidal frontal assaults against the enemy, like Highlanders and Irish rebels against the English back home. Uh, the North, according to Grady McQuinney, in the meantime, coldly deployed its industrial might and numerical superiority to grind down the South with its Protestant Cromwellian efficiency. Um, as McQuinney puts it, quote, Southerners lost the war because they were too Celtic and their opponents were too English. And there is a certain, of course, nostalgia for the old ways of the South to this vanished civilizations. You certainly have echoes of it in, in films, you know, like Gone with the Wind, um, that um, there is this fond memory of an entirely different civilization from the predominant one that now um, characterizes the United States. We as well uh, have um, a number of uh, so-called revisionists, uh, some revisionists argue that, in fact, the war was not at all inevitable the way William Seward first said it was. Uh, James, D, um, James G. Randall and Avery Craven, for example, argue that the war was um, not at all inevitable, that slavery had uh, been an issue for 60 years, and we'll see it had been in fact, um, you know, why did it suddenly reach this crisis uh, point? The revisionists argue that it was a generation essentially of blundering politicians who exaggerated an issue beyond their control. Um, today, Michael Holt, the political crisis of the 1850s is the title of his book. He's one of the leading historians of this school, arguing that not only the blunders of politicians, but the collapse of the American party system of that period as well led to the war. And we certainly are going to look at, at um, the collapse of the um, second American party system and, and what exactly does that mean and, and what impact it did have on this kind of polarization in American uh, politics. Um, Holt does not necessarily link the collapse of the party system to the debate over slavery, but it is linked to it. 
Um, but he does look to the so-called, as I say, ethnocultural um, divide between the South and the North, um, you know, on issues such as uh, both temperance, nativism, and, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, finally, um, we may look at yet another very simple argument that um, argues that this war really was about um, constitutional issues, um, federal powers versus state rights, um, that it was a war over the definition of the relationship, the nature, and the extent of the sovereignty of the individual states making up the union and the power of the center in Washington to govern the United States. And we'll see that during the debates between southern and northern states, um, there is a big question about did the Constitution of the United States provide for the secession of any of its states if they so chose to do so. Um, it's not explicitly stated in the Constitution, but it is an issue still debated today between those who argue that state participation in the Union was provisional and that sovereignty essentially was vested in the states, that it remained in the states, that the United States was actually a contractual compact of individual sovereign states that had the right to secede from that contract should they choose to do so. Um, and, uh, you know, there is just a slight linguistic um, element of evidence for that argument. Um, before the Civil War, um, the United States were referred to in the plural. The United States are. Um, the United States are deciding to do this. The United States have chosen to go to war. After the Civil War, the United States becomes singular. The United States is deciding to do this. The United States is a free country and so forth. And, and so some historians argue that that's what the Civil War did. It changed an R to an is. So that for you is a rough sketch of, of, of kind of the broad um, historiographical approaches to what exactly was the Civil War. And, and, and so keep those in mind as we begin to shake out the actual narrative of um, the, the um, war and the elements that came to lead to it.